Tonight, from the Revolt World stage in Atlanta, a very special Revolt Black News. Black women are vanishing, gone missing without a trace. What's behind the epidemic of missing black women and girls? I am on Interstate 459, and there is a kid just walking by their cell. Carly Russell's story riveted the nation. The 25-year-old reportedly vanishing after claiming she stopped to help a child stranded on the highway. Hundreds have come to search for Carly Russell. But her story turned out to be a shameless lie. Turns out her lawyer says she was never kidnapped. A hoax that cut deep because it was the first time the case of a missing black woman got the serious attention it deserved, making Carly Russell a household name. Carly was our first case to go viral, to get that coveted around the clock media coverage. But time and time again, it's the missing white women who get wall to wall coverage. Gabby Petito's body was officially identified today. This isn't saying that Gabby Petito is not important. What it is saying is that there's an overrepresentation in media when white women go missing and an underrepresentation in media when black, brown, and indigenous women go missing. But it's our stories that desperately need attention. In 2022 alone, almost 100,000 black women and girls vanished without a trace. And I'm worried about her. I want my grandbaby. The numbers are staggering. 40% of the missing population are people of color. Missing black women aren't just ignored by the media. The police have not taken this serious. Thousands of other people of color that are reported missing and they're not getting the law enforcement resources. That neglect often leads to devastating consequences. Black women make up 40% of people who have survived sex trafficking, though we're just 14% of the female population overall. Tell me about this girl. What does she look like? She was kind of thin, dark skin. She's out there hustling. And many predators know that the way to get away with murder is to target victims that no one is looking for. That was serial killer Samuel Little's tactic. He murdered 93 people, mostly black and brown women. This crisis must be stopped. So Revolt World asks, where are they? She didn't return from school. Who took them? Keisha Jacobs is my daughter. The last day I saw her was 2016. And how do we get them home? Welcome to the Revolt Black News panel, Dangerous Black Girl Magic. Now you see her, now you don't. I'm Mara Escampo, the managing editor and global news anchor of Revolt Black News. And I'm joined by our correspondent, Kennedy Rue. Kennedy is in the audience, and Kennedy will be helping us field some of your questions later. As you just saw, our topic today is really serious. Black women and girls are disappearing at record numbers, at record numbers. Now, this may sound like it's a story about someone else, but this is really a story about so many of you in this audience because you are at risk. Young black women are at risk. The scope of this problem is massive and it is alarming, but don't just take it from me. Take it from someone who has been through it. Alexis Skye is a star of VH1's Love & Hip Hop. She is also an entrepreneur and a mother, and she recently revealed that she is also a survivor of sex trafficking. Alexis, thank you for being here. I know that um, this is difficult for you to talk about, um, and that you are doing this in part to raise awareness and to help people who are still struggling. So thank you for, for sharing your story in service of women who are still suffering. Um, you fell into sex trafficking when you were just a teenager by someone who was much older than you. So I was a runaway um, at a young age, um, and I was just one of those young girls that just wanted to be free. I got set up by a friend, actually, because um, I needed somewhere to stay. She was like, you know, I have a room for you, and you're going to be a waitress and all this stuff. So I was like, okay. Um, but I ended up being in a, um, a house full of women. And I didn't know what was going on, so I'm just thinking, like, what's happening? And I actually probably was the youngest one there. I was around 15 or 16 years old. And um, at that very moment, he 
just took my phone, anything that I had in my purse, like threw it in the water. I didn't know what was going on. I was really confused. Um, and I just was like, what's happening? And um, the very first night I was taken to the club and sold off and raped and just a lot. And this was just my life every day. So I think it was just like, you know, any woman's biggest nightmare. Um, just being a, you know held against your will and having to do things with older men and I wasn't even developed yet so just older men here in Atlanta was able to like you know do sexual things with me and I just felt hopeless I think daily I was just wanting to give up because I'm just like I'm never gonna make it out I'm never gonna make it out and I just had to like gain courage and realize like there is an end and there's gonna you know I'm gonna put up a fight because I won't allow this to happen it was only, I think, about maybe 60 to 90 days. I can't remember. I used to just tally on my wall, like, just trying to figure out. I was trying to jump out the window. I was trying to kill myself at some point because I'm just like, I'm, nobody's going to know where I'm at. I was in a house. There was no neighbors. There was dogs everywhere. If I, like, try to talk to anybody, he would abuse me, beat me up. Like, one time he put me in the trunk for like three, four hours, tied me up, and I almost thought I was gonna die then. And I was just being sold off every night. Like, it doesn't matter how many people it was. So at that point, I thought like, you know, God forbid I was, I caught AIDS or like, I just didn't know how I was gonna die, I thought I was. It, it was just messed up. And and you're, you're so brave to, to be reliving this because I know it's very difficult for you to talk about yeah. it. But when we talk about sex trafficking, um, it often feels very disconnected. You know, we don't really know what that means day to day. And so you're shedding a lot of insight yeah. into what these women and, and girls, you were 15 years old, you were a young girl, yeah. are going through. When you say that you were, you were sold off, what what does that transaction look like? Do, do you meet the man? Is there a conversation with him? So he would, you know, dress us up a certain way and then take us out um, and, like, pretty much he had his customers that was paying for girls, you know, to sleep with them. So I was, you know, young, and so I was pretty much, like, his number one girl at the time. So he was, like... Because like, you were young. Yeah, and he just was working me constantly. And help us understand that system of control, of, of keeping you captive. Why, and of course, you were not responsible for any of what happened to you, but somebody might say, well, why didn't you try to call your family? Or why didn't you try yes. to run away? How were you kept in control? He had my information. So I think he used, like, you know, I'm going to kill your family. I'm going to kill you. You know, he had pictures of my mom. I, he had pictures of my brothers. And so it was more so of a fear. And, you know, at the time, my mom didn't know I was missing. Like, I wasn't a missing child. Like, she knew I ran away, but I was always ending up, like, at a friend's house or things like that. So she didn't really even know what was going on for those 60 days because I had no way to contact her at all. There was no TVs in the house. There was no computers. There was no phones, nothing. And how were you feeling when you would wake up in the morning and realize? I didn't sleep. I, sleep didn't exist to me. I was up, you know, till eight in the morning working. So, and when I did sleep, I was scared to sleep because I didn't know what was gonna happen next. And you know, when you're in that in that um, space, sleep doesn't really exist. You know, you're on drugs. You're just up. You're awake. You just want to leave. Like every time I would go back, I was trying to figure out how I was leaving out. Every day, like if it was the basement, but it was so many dogs everywhere that there was it was impossible. Like you know, how did you get out? So I think it was just my angel, to be honest. Um, I met a guy, and well, I didn't meet him, but he was obviously somebody that was a potential customer. And I just was like, me, and I, I couldn't take it anymore because I was tired. Like, I was tired, I was tired, I was tired. I'm like, at this point, I'm just going to run. But I didn't know, he you know, used to threaten me that he would kill me and stuff. But this man, um, I was just like tearing up to him like this. And I'm like, help me, help me, help me. But I didn't say it. I was just whispering it to him. And he looked, and I knew he knew that I wasn't of age, and he wanted to help me. And so he paid the guy, and he dropped me off at the bus station. And I was free, so I didn't really, you know, have to really fight. I didn't. You know, it just happened. Do you know who that man is? Have you ever had a chance to speak to him? No, he didn't ask me anything. He didn't even ask my name. He just dropped me off and I took the bus. I want to bring in now Melanie Thompson. Melanie is an activist with the Coalition Against Trafficking in Women and also a sex trafficking survivor. Melanie, speak to some of what Alexis is, is going through right now. What is life like for survivors of sex trafficking? It's difficult overall. I mean, 
I always say that you can take the person off the street, but you can't take the street out of the person. And I don't mean that from like a hustler's mentality. I mean that in that all of the psychological effects that come after that, they last for a lifetime. You know, people often ask us, uh, survivor leaders, they'll say, you know, how did you heal? Or how is it that you're doing this every day? And the truth of the matter is that I feel like the healing journey is gonna be lifelong. There's PTSD, there's flashbacks, the way that you look at yourself in the mirror, the, the things that we were told, especially when you're under pimp control or trafficker control, the things that you had to learn about yourself or teach yourself about yourself in order to endure some of those negative things that Alexis was mentioning, you know? That's not something that most people can them. And you know, I often, when, we, when it comes to sex trafficking in particular, you know, anybody who's been raped once or sexually assaulted or molested, that can break somebody's mental for a lifetime. Now, if you imagine that kind of paid rape repetitively, day in and day out for hours on end, probably not eating the way you should, maybe malnourished, maybe not, maybe bathing, maybe not. That, that kind of turmoil is something that most people twice, three times, 10 times my age couldn't even fathom. So it's extremely difficult. But I will say that, like Alexis, um, you know, for those of us who do have the privilege to make it out, uh, most of us, all the ones that I know, we have decided to try to take our life in a different direction. That's not a life we want to stay in, and it's not a life we want to continue. And Melanie, you had a, a, you're also a survivor. You had a similar experience. How old were you when you were sex trafficked? I was trafficked when I was 12. 12 years old. Mm -hmm. So you were a child. Yeah. When we come back, why aren't authorities looking for our young black women and girls? But first, we want to share some more of Melanie's story of survival. One day I went to the movie theaters with two of my girlfriends in the sixth grade at the time. And when the movie was done, we were on our way back home and we ran into these two boys that we knew from our middle school. And the boys invited us back to their house and we ended up going back there with them. After they kept feeding us a lot of alcohol, I blacked out and woke up with one of the boys raping me. My two girlfriends were gone. We were in the basement of this house. But when I got to the top of the stairs, the boy who just finished raping me came back with an older man who told me that I wasn't going anywhere. At that point, he literally picked me up and put me over his shoulder and I'm kicking and screaming and trying to bite him. Uh, but he walked me across the street to an abandoned house uh, and locked me in the closet of this abandoned house from the outside. There was a bed bug infested mattress that laid on the floor, no sheet or anything. It started initially with different random men that I didn't know coming to the house. Um, and they would come to this, this closet and have their ways with me. And then after they started coming to the house, he would start bringing me out to underground strip clubs, streets in different parts of New York City, taking me in the back of cars. So plot twist in the story, um, I know everybody wants to believe that I was rescued and saved and you know, all these fairy tale things. And unfortunately, um, that was not the case for me. So an anonymous tip did come into the police Initially, my family thought I may have run away, so there was a warrant out for my arrest to bring me back. Uh, two detectives from missing persons were the ones who, who brought me out. They literally had to pry the door open. When my parents tried to advocate to bring me home, uh, the judge sent me upstate, and I have been in the foster care system and bounced around to multiple residential treatment facilities from the time that I was 13 to now. In hindsight, I can't believe that I've lived through a lot of that. But at the same time, it's not an uncommon story for, for Black children and Black girls in particular. You know, we are the population that's kind of left by the wayside. Right now, I wanna bring in two women who are working to protect black women who are fighting to change the terrible reality that we are seeing. 
Derricka Wilson is the co-founder and CEO of the Black and Missing Foundation. She is also a former police officer and human trafficking investigator. And Natalie Wilson is the co-founder and COO of the Black and Missing Foundation and a public relations and media expert. So, and then I direct this question to both of you, and, and this may seem like a very difficult question to answer, but when we're talking about almost 100,000 black women and girls that have gone missing in one year alone, where are they? By and large, what is happening to these women, and why is law enforcement, and why is the media not taking this more seriously? It's hard to imagine if 100,000 blonde children went missing that it wouldn't be considered a, a nationwide epidemic. I think we need to peel back the layers even further. The key is reported missing because some cases are not reported, so we know that the numbers are much higher. And from a law enforcement perspective, sadly, law enforcement don't see us as being worthy. They classify our cases as runaways. Runaway does not meet the criteria for Amber Alert. They make families wait 24 hours before reporting their loved ones missing. And the first 24 to 48 hours are the most critical moments when a person is missing. And again, they don't view us as valuable members of our community. It's more so that throwaway. And when you have that label of runaway, there's this perception in society is that whatever happens to that child, they brought it on themselves because they decided to leave. And also, Natalie, you know, just because someone has run away doesn't mean, especially if they're a minor, that they're still not in incredible danger on the streets and that that shouldn't be, be addressed more seriously. How much do you think that class, in addition to race, has to do with it? Class plays a vital role in how the media handles these cases. If the community isn't aware that someone is missing, then they're not looking for them. Media coverage puts pressure on law enforcement to add resources to the case. And sadly, these cases are going under the radar at an alarming rate. I don't know if you all know this, but 40% of the missing population are people of color. And we tend to think that sex trafficking is happening abroad. As the guest said, it's happening in our backyards. It's happening to our boys and girls. And we have to do something about it. We can no longer turn a blind eye to this issue. And that is what we're seeing. You know, people are saying, I don't know that missing person, so I'm not going to share the flyer. Well, these are our mothers, our fathers, our children that are disappearing at an alarming rate. And it doesn't matter where they reside. It doesn't matter their zip code. They need to be found. They need to be rehabilitated. And it's so challenging for me to get media coverage because oftentimes I'm met with silence or disinterest. With, uh, with the media. And in many cases, it's not some stranger that kind of comes out of the dark and snatches you. These women are being groomed, and they come to trust the person that then betrays them. What does that look like? What can grooming look like? And how can you identify those signs to see that this, this person could potentially have very dark plans in mind for me? I was just going to mention, I love that you brought that up because a lot of people don't know that 40% of those who are sex trafficked in the U.S. are done so through familial trafficking. So Family members. Through a family member. So a lot of people don't recognize that this could be the uncle, the cousin, the auntie, whatever have you. Um, but then additionally, I know Alexis was mentioning this when she was talking about her story, you know, it could happen through a boyfriend, right? That's very common in the U.S. compared to countries abroad. This could, it could be somebody posing uh, as someone who wants to court you. And then, you know, three months, six months, one year into the relationship, they, traffickers run the long haul, right? They stick with you and really make you believe that you can trust them and that you're not like the people that we're talking about. And then they use all types of different grooming and manipulation tactics. You know, I think it's important for everyone in here to understand that human trafficking is a multi-billion dollar industry that's happening on U.S. soil. I think it's also important for people to understand that people are not for sale. This is an epidemic that is happening in plain sight, and there is a target on the backs of our children, our women, our men. Derricka, when it comes to, to, to protecting yourself, how do you identify 
somebody who may be of risk to you? What are some of the signs, some, some real red flags that this person may be dangerous? Some predators, they actually brand their victims. They put tattoos on their victims so they can identify who works for them. They do the markings. So that is one thing that we see that's happening with cases that are coming in, and just statistically. And then you have children that may be coming in with clothes or cell phones, um, expensive items that you didn't wait, you didn't purchase. If they are staying online longer than usual, you know, that could be a sign. If they are going out and staying out with friends longer than usual, if they have an older boyfriend or an older girlfriend. So these are just some things to really keep in mind because they're preying on vulnerability. They're preying on vulnerability, and sadly, in our community, there are so many children that are vulnerable that are just simply looking for a way out, and they're giving these children all of these false promises. Coming up, a desperate mother's search to find her missing daughter. Jacob's 21-year-old daughter, Kishé, was headed to a friend's house in 2016, and Tony has not seen her since. Tony, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. So your daughter is one of the women who were missing. So yeah. she would be 28 years old now. Tell me what happened. She told you she was going to a friend's house, and she vanished. Yeah, Kishé just had turned 21, August the 6th. Um, doing what any normal 21-year-old would do. Mom going over with my friends. I was like, okay, you know, just leave me alone. That's, you know how you, the kids are. I was like, just call and let me know that you made it there safe. And she was like, all right. I get the text about 11 something. Mom here, I'm okay. I was like, all right, just be careful. Yes, ma'am. And then she was like, I'll see you tomorrow. And I was like, I love you. She was like, I love you too. That was my last message. Like the next day, um, Kishay normally would call me by my lunch break, and I hadn't heard anything. I probably would have got like 50 text messages by 12, but I didn't get any. And I was like, it, it seemed odd to me. But then I started calling her phone. It was going to voicemail. Um, by the time I got off work, I started calling her friends. I use that word loosely. And everybody say they haven't seen her. They would check around and see if they could find her. I go try to go to bed that night. Then I wake up like 1, 2 o'clock in the morning. Then I start going knocking at people's doors because I'm going where I know I done dropped her off, picked her up. Any of these places where I know she, you know, I have the addresses. Nobody's seen her. So that Wednesday, um, about, I want to say about 6.30, 7 o'clock that night, she had about four or five of her friends show up at my door to let me know that they dropped her off at a house. So I made them take me to the house. Um, we get to the house. Um, the guy says, yeah, I know Keisha. She always come over here with, and she pointed to the friend. So I proceed to look at that friend and like, whoa. You act like you don't know nothing about this house or this person or anything. So then I asked him, when did he see her? He told me he first he saw her at 5 o'clock on that Monday. I was like, no, you couldn't have. Because she was at home. I, I mean, I was talking to my daughter. Changed the time again. He changed the time several times, so I decided to call the police. They told me somebody would talk to me, but it was like a week later that I even talked to a detective about my daughter's case. But that was after, like, that fall that Sunday, we did a, like, um, what you call it, like a rally, passed out flyers and went door to door. So you printed the flyers, you organized groups. Yes, I paid for it out of my pocket. What have you heard from law enforcement since? Have they been helpful to you? In the beginning, no. Um, when I say no, like, they went into the house and they found her DNA in the house. 
They um, did. Yes, but they said it was not enough blood to say that she was gone. So I was like, okay, because I point blank asked them, do you think my baby's deceased? And they was like, no. Um, so that was within a few weeks of her being missing. But it took them two years to say it was foul play of her being missing. So it never re got released to the public that somebody did something and took her. And when it comes to us, first thing people say is, oh, she just ran off with a boyfriend. I was like, ain't no man no good that she can run away and not call her mom and tell her. And then it was, she's pregnant. And I was like, she's 21. I don't care about her being pregnant. But even when I reported it to the police, he was like, they was like, well, she's 21. Maybe she don't want to be bothered. And I was like, she could have called me and told me that. Did they say that to you? Yes. So I literally had to plead my case, open my phone, and show them calls and text messages. This girl text me for everything. Like, I'd be like, I'm, stop texting me. I see you when I get off. It's an everyday thing. And the fact that I had to plead my case just for them to even take the report, not for nobody to come see me, because they didn't come until after the family was like, well, just tell the police. They don't have to get a search warrant. You can just come on into the house. And Alexis, that you, this is I'm making sorry, you emotional. Alexis, Why? I'm sorry. What, what part of Quiche's story is connecting with you? She's my age. So, She's your age. Yeah. Or this, well, I'm 29. I just turned 29. But I just, I, I didn't even know sitting next to you. I didn't know you were going through that. I'm so sorry. And Thank you. We'll fight to keep looking for her. Thank you. I'm the same age as your daughter, so I just, I, I don't know, and I just know I left home, and you know, I just can imagine my mom sitting here saying the same thing if I wasn't, if I didn't come back, or if I never made it back, you know? Thank you. Tony, what, what do you think may have happened? Do, do you believe that she's still somewhere out there seeking help? In my heart, I don't believe, like, I don't believe she's gone. In my heart, I don't feel it. And they say your mother has these intuitions. And in my heart, I know my baby's out there. Take your this time. is hard for me because Tuesday will mark seven years that she's been missing. And with every being in me, I'm going to continue to fight to bring my daughter home. <sighs> um, I, I, I want, yeah, Natalie, go ahead. That's why community engagement is so important. Someone knows something, and we have to get away from that no snitching. This is a mother who's hurting. She wants to find her daughter. And in the audience, just share Quiche's profile. We just need one person, one person to come forward so that Tony can have the answers that she deserves. It's not fair to her. And what infuriates me, and I've heard this, Tony, from so many black families, is that they have to convince law enforcement that their loved one didn't, do, they say, oh, well, they're on drugs, they ran away, they don't wanna be bothered with you. They have to spend their own money to start organizing search parties and trying to find dogs that can sniff around and go door to door asking people for surveillance video. Families are doing law enforcement work by themselves. So how can we force law enforcement to do their jobs for our community? There's a couple of things. First and foremost, there is no unified policy Law enforcement operates at their discretion based on their county and jurisdiction. So in this county to the left, they may tell the families to wait 24 hours, but in this county to the right, they could report immediately. So we're working with legislators to create a unified policy holistically where law enforcement handle cases, regardless of race, gender, and zip code, the same way. Because it's so important for everyone to understand, law enforcement work for you. 
they're public servants. You don't work for law enforcement and hold their feet to the fire. And the other issue that we're also seeing is that those that are policing our community are not from the community that they're policing. And so that there's a huge disconnect right there alone. But I think it's important for you to hold their feet to the fire um, because they have to do their job. No family should have to go through what Kishay's mom is going through, what Alania's family went through, what Shay Shay's family is going through, what Tiffany Foster's family is going through. There are so many families who are looking for their child. We want to take a minute to highlight just a few that are missing, whose families are looking for them, because the awareness is so important. And we're going to put their pictures up. We're going to say their names. And again, if you know anything, please reach out. 31-year-old Alexis Ware. Alexis has been missing since January 2022. 39-year-old Ebony Varner. Ebony's been missing since June 2023. It's just been a few months. 25-year-old Alani Lenoir. She's been missing since July of 2022. Tiffany Foster has been missing since March of 2021. And Shaikemia Shai Shai Pate. She's been missing since September 1998. She was just eight years old when she vanished. Today she would be 33 years old. And their families are here with us today. They're here in the front row. They've joined us to share their stories um, and some of the challenges that, that they've been facing. Uh, I want to start with uh, LaShonda and Veronica. Shai Shai's family. Shai Shai has been missing the longest of, of all of our families. She's been missing for 25 years. And last year, you actually thought that you found her, that you, you thought there was a break in the case. What happened? Well, uh, a young lady contacted my mom on, well, on Facebook Messenger and said that she believed that she might be Shai Shai. But you know, after they went and tried to find out and do DNA and everything, turns out not her. So it's like reliving it again, you know. Uh, and April, uh, your your sister uh, Ebony is missing, and and you told us uh, this week was really tough for you because you started picking up your sister's things and putting them in storage. What was that like for you to have to start taking those steps? For me, it was very hard. My mom was going to come, but, you know, I saw that she kind of had every reason why not to come. And I knew that for her, coming would kind of finalize the fact that Ebony's missing. You know, I, well, not necessarily missing, but I think for my mom, it would have made it seem like she's just gone. I don't feel like my sister's gone. I really don't. But... At the end of the day, you know, it was her house. She was paying the bills. So it's like, what? I didn't anybody paying the bills. I'm going to have to move her stuff because we don't need it outside on the street. We've seen how devastating this issue is for the families of missing women and how little attention they've gotten from the press. Coming up, we're going to tell you how likely you would be to get media attention if you disappeared. But first, have you seen these women? get to some of your questions. So this is a question from Shamaya Richardson. What specifically needs to happen to increase the presence and influence of black women in leadership positions who care about these issues? And what policy changes need to take place to bring these numbers down and to start bringing some of these women home? Well, we need to peel back the layers and first understand why so many black women and girls are going missing. We know sex trafficking is one of them, and we talked about changing laws. But we also need to look at the media and hold them accountable as well, because that media coverage puts pressure on law enforcement to add resources to the case. 
We also need to look at enhancing the public communication alert system. Right now, there are two alert systems. One, the Amber Alert for individuals under the age of 18. The second is the Silver Alert for individuals over the age of 65. Most people who go missing fall in another category. So we have to do a better job in amplifying their stories so the community is aware that they're missing and we can actively look for them. Black women and girls remain missing four times longer than their white counterparts. And we have to do what we can to bring them home. Please. Hi, good afternoon, ladies. Thank you for everything that y'all are doing. Um, one of my loved ones, Lonnie Lenore, she's missing. Um, and I just wanted to ask more so towards law enforcement. Um, we're seeking justice, but our loved one is still missing. So we want to know what can we do to help or how can we ensure that charges will be brought up? Because again, if they're missing, you know, we, we still need our justice. That's a great question. And, you know, in cer certain states, sometimes they will do a declaration, especially when a person has been missing for so long. One thing that I certainly encourage you all to do, if you all have it, and I know the push that you all are doing for Fruity. Uh, we've been there and get with those elected leaders. Everyone has a boss. So I believe in going to the top, not the detective, the police chief. If the chief is not doing what he or she should be doing, then you go to the city council, the city mayor, and you go to the DA. And you have to continue and, and never stop what you're doing because we all see it, they see it. And as Natalie mentioned, no law enforcement agency wants to be embarrassed, but you, you hate to say using a specific date to highlight, but when you were thinking about birthdays, we're thinking about the anniversary, those are opportunities for you to continue to amplify the story, to apply pressure to law enforcement so they can dedicate the resources so they can bring justice to you and your family. And please keep the conversation going. Email us, let us know any information that you know or if you have cases that need to be highlighted. Thank you guys. Wait, what's the, what is it? Tell me what is it? Sorry, I gotta let everyone know. It's finding underscore underscore fruity. That, and that's for Alani Lenoir? That's for Alani Lenoir, yes. Okay, finding underscore underscore fruity. And yes. email us. Thank you. Okay? Yes. Okay, thank you. And as we've uh, talked about, one of the big problems is getting media attention, media coverage for women of color. We've, we've all seen that time and time again. So the Columbia Journalism Review actually created a website. It's called areyoupressworthy.com, where you put in some of your personal information, you put in your age, your gender, your race, and where you live, and it will tell you how likely you are to get press coverage if you went missing. So you can take some time to do that, areyoupressworthy.com. I did it. It told me that I would get eight stories. There would be eight news stories done about me if I went missing. The average white woman in her early 20s would get 120. That's more than 15 times the coverage that I would get. So if you're curious about how much press you're worth, take some time to check that out. When we come back, the things you need to know to stay safe. So in terms of keeping all of us safe, you have things that we can do to be safer. Can, can you tell us what those things are? Well, number one is monitor what you do online. We are use, utilizing social media. Everyone is posting, I am in Miami at a certain hotel or restaurant. You never know who's following you. Be mindful of the information that you're sharing online. Since the pandemic, we have seen an uptick in cases because we are spending most of our time online, so are the predators and the pimps, and they are grooming our children through these platforms. So what are some other things that we can all do to stay safe? You know, domestic violence is also a reason why people are going missing also, and for everyone out there to understand that love does not hurt, 
it should not hurt. And we really need to have stiffer, stiffer penalties for those abusers. Um, and just trust your instincts. Always remain vigilant, but trust your gut, trust your instincts, because even with sex trafficking, you have your lookers and your spotters. And this day and time, we are all embedded in our technology, so our faces are buried in technology. So at least be aware and turn on those notifications on your phone, like where you are, and share that information with a trusted family member or friend. You know, you're never too old to let someone know where you are going. But understanding that a lot of you may have family in other states and no one here, at least let a friend or a family member be able to track your steps because that is so critical when it comes to finding and bringing our missing home. And Alexis, you have some advice for if you're in trouble, there are things you can do. Really, one of them is really smart. What, what's some of your advice for trying to get some help when you need it? Just being aware of your surroundings and like, you know, not being alone where you're like, I went to the supermarket last night and it kind of triggered me because it was late. I was driving by myself, you know, like sharing a location with your friends. And I just keep my circle small and my trust, like I have, you know, trust issues with people. So all my friends, we share locations and you know, they know, especially if I'm leaving out the country and things of that nature. Yeah. So. If you need help, if you know someone who has gone missing and you are desperate to get media attention, you are not getting the attention that you want, that is part of why we are here. We want to help you. We will be highlighting the stories. This does not end today. Revolt Black News is committed to highlighting these stories and to trying to bring as many of these women home as possible. So email us, newsdesk at revolt.tv. You can email us, newsdesk at revolt.tv. If you have a story that needs media attention, we are here for you. Thank you all so much for sharing your stories. Thank you for, I know this was hard for you, but it's helping so many. We hope that by highlighting Quiche's story, that maybe that can bring a lead in that will, will will generate new information. Thank you. And thank you all for the advocacy and the work that you are doing to to help all of our sisters. We really appreciate everything that you're doing. Thank you. Well, unfortunately, uh, we're out of time because there's another group that that has to take the stage, but I would love to keep you guys connected just so you feel supported in in whatever you you. decide to do. Thank you all for being here. Thank you to the families for being here. We certainly hope that this helps in some way. And please keep the conversation going. Email us, let us know any information that you know or if you have cases that need to be highlighted. Thank you, guys. And that's it. I think we're done. Remember to stay connected with us on Facebook, X, Revolts on YouTube, our Revolt Black News podcast, and download the Revolt app.